skull, starting of my skull. And the interesting things, we're going to talk about interesting things. First, we all have lovely eye sockets. And we have an open the area for the nose here. There are some bones inside the nose that we really don't need to worry too much about. Uh, coming down from, and I'm doing a front view because it's, it's just, uh, I'll do a side view maybe in the next view next time. Your cheekbones are called the zygomatic arch. And they stretch out, and they're actually what they are, what they're for, is a shelf to hang a bunch of other muscles on. So if you, this, and this front curls into here. Okay, some basic anatomical terminology that is always good to know. If it's median, medial, it means it's in the middle. If it's lateral, it means it's on the outside. If it's a superior, it means there's two muscles and one's above and one's below. Um, you know already about things like quadriceps, that's a four-headed muscle. Biceps, that's a two-headed muscle. There are some multi-headed muscles in the face as well. Uh, of course, the main point of learning all this stuff is that when you do your final face and you're looking at, hopefully looking by observation, and then when you get to the point where you're drawing from imagination, you will see the where the overlaps are. All right. Rule number one with teeth. Let me just put that out there right now. Never, ever draw the teeth like this. Okay, because that won't look like teeth. Teeth are actually nothing more than a shadow side and a light side, and a shadow side and a light side, and the shadow side comes up to the light side. So if you just give it just a bit of shadow, you can have some teeth. Not a whole lot of definition, maybe a little bit of shadow on the teeth underneath. And then we're going to do, now if you're doing the skull, it does get pretty dark where the where the uh, tooth inserts into the bone. So you will have that. But normally you're not seeing the teeth unless you're trying to do a toothy grin or if you're trying to do a monster that has all of his teeth open, bared. <laughs> um, all right, so there's that's how you do the teeth. Now, the eye sockets are pretty big. It's surprising how big they are. And it's surprising how big eyeballs are, actually. So I'm going to put an eyeball inside one of these things just to give you an idea of how big it is. The eyeball itself is about that. Mm, about that big. Now, eyeballs. Little, little, te little, little tutorial on eyeballs. Some of you guys have already seen these, but it's fun anyway. Um, the eyeball is a spherical object filled with a gelatinous substance, and it has a, a lens on the front and cornea, which is a basically a clear cover, just a clear protective cover. The iris, which we see as a pupil and some color with lines around it, that's actually a muscle, opens and closes. And what it does is it focuses the lens, which of course, when the image comes in, it turns upside down and focuses against the back wall, if you have good vision. If you're nearsighted, then it focuses, your eyeball is too long and it focuses before the back wall. If you're farsighted, your eyeball is too short and it's focusing uh, the opposite of what I just said. It's focusing too soon if you're nearsighted and too late if you're farsighted. But the most intriguing thing about the eyes, it's really cool to look at cat eyes because cat eyes don't, aren't, you don't see the whites of their eyes, you just see their whole eye. And if you look at the cat from the side, you'll see their opening of their eye in a flat disc and this clear thing that covers it over from top to bottom. So remember that the eyeball is wet, always wet unless it's dead. If you're dead, well, the red balls might not be wet. They kind of shrivel up and dry up like raisins. But <laughs> so think of it as always being wet and drippy. 
it's an awesome, awesome thing. And then there's always little veins on it and stuff like that. So we put the eyeball deep inside the ocular cavity and then add all kinds of muscles and flesh on the inside. And then we're going to cover that over with skin. So calm down. On the zy zygomatic arch, there is a place that's called fossas. Whenever you hear the word fossa, it means an indentation in the bone. Um, whenever you hear the word tuberosity, it means there's a sticky out bit of the bone. And these are all places where muscles are going to connect to. That's why bones are kind of all craggy and bumpy and things they need to have places for the muscles to grab onto. Now, in the face, there are, in the, in the head, I should say, I lost my notes, hold on. There are 43 muscles in the face. 26 muscles are used to smile. Now this doesn't make sense. It says 62 are used to frown, which means there's more than 43 muscles in the face, unless the frowning is being also controlled by muscles outside of the face. Yes, that's why the eyes are so shiny, because they're wet, wet and gooey. Um, it's a good practice just to get a feel of the, the shading and the bones and trying to understand that there's a, a rim around here. There's also, with men, it's, um, it's a larger protuberance. It's called a superciliary arch. And that's the bone structure that arises up over the top of the eye to give the manly look. Men are also going to have a broader uh, mental protuberance. And if you think about it, a mental t protuberance, how many of you have ever put your chin on your, <laughs> on your, your chin, your hand on your chin when you're thinking? You put your, put your knuckle on your chin while you're thinking. That's why I think it's called the mentalis, because I think you have to hold on to it to think. That's my own personal pet uh, explanation for that. In the skull also, you will notice there's little openings and there's places for nerves, blood vessels to pass through to the top of the, to the skin. <laughs> And all right, they, when you're born, there's 22 bones in the head and they're separate. And as you get older, of course, they close up. Anyone who has had a baby knows that there's a soft spot in the top of the baby's head. And it's like a little triangle thing. It's called a fontanelle. And it's caused by the bones being separate so that the head can get Ma you know, so it's malleable, so you can squish it so it can go where it needs to go. And it cuts where they come out as cone heads. And that's it's very logical. It makes total sense. I mean, the babies stay in there as long as they possibly can until they have to come out. And their their, but their brains aren't done growing. So they come out with a kind of a loose brain thing, um, holder. And then that eventually seals up. There's also seal, there's... Uh, places where the bones crack that are, that are sutured. They're called sutures when they're like that, and they always look like the fjords of Norway. And they uh, attach all around. So the skull is not one big solid bone. It's actually made of many kinds of bone. And you would consider there's two zygomatic arches. There's two maxilla, which is the top part of, if I, I might be pronouncing the words wrong, and I apologize in advance, but the two parts of the bone here. There's one front frontal eminence, the frontal bone, and the part that sticks out on the bone, the forehead part, is called the frontal eminence. On the side, you have two plates, and they're called, they crack along right about here, and they're called the parietal eminent, the parietal bones, and the part where they bulge out the highest curve on those parietal bones is called the parietal eminence. So if you feel your own head, go ahead and feel your own head and you'll see, okay, there's a bump in the lump in the front. So that's your, your frontal eminence. 
And then there is a place on the side of your head above your ears that curves out more and then it curves back in. And that's your par par parietal eminence. Okay. Let's see if there's any other good things. Okay. On the teeth, this part of the place where the teeth actually hook into, it's called the dental arch. And you can't see it from the front as easily, but I can show you on the skull, on the actual skull. There's a part of the skull that comes in here of the jawbone. You look at the jawbone. This is where the hinge is. This is the auditory. This is where the ear comes in the auditory canal. And this is called the ramus. And all it's there for is to attach a bunch of different muscles. Because you imagine, look at, you can look at the face, the skull, and you can see there's an awful lot of stuff missing on that skull, and it's all muscles. All muscles. So, so let's put this one in the oven to bake. And we're going to take out the finished one with the camera that doesn't want to be focused. Mastic magic, presto magic. It's kind of, kind of fuzzy. It's gonna, it's gonna come. It's it has to. It takes a little while to cook. There, look at that. See, it's ready to come out of the oven. It's awesome. Check that out. Now that's one beautiful skull. Okay. Now I didn't outline the teeth. Note that I just did little shadows on the teeth. Nice shadows into the eye. Got some plain, you, well, you're not going to be drawing just skulls. You want to draw the face. So the face is the next thing up. And what we're going to do is I've got an outline version of the skull. And on the outline version of the skull, we're going to do, hang on, so we're going to do the muscles. Because it's a super... It's the superficial anatomy that is most important when you're when you are a figurative artist. It's what's on the surface that causes what's underneath to be what it needs to be. So in the very front, we have uh, something called an ep epicranius, and it's this muscle that comes down from the top like this and essentially what it does it's a kind of a two-part muscle it can move both ways but it moves your scalp back and forth it's pretty thin now most of the muscles are thin on the bone or they're not even any muscle they're skins which is why you hit your head you bleed like crazy because there's nothing but skin and bone there but the front of your forehead is pretty darn hard and don't know how many people have rammed into a wall. My sister did, got a bunch of stitches, but she didn't break the bone. Now there's a cool little muscle that's right, kind of separate, comes right down in here, and it's called the corrugator. And all the muscles have meanings. It's really hysterical. So this is the corrugator, and it kind of attaches to the top part of the nasal bone, which is a little separate bone right here. Stables. Oh my God. I don't want staples in my head. So that, of course, what it does is it wrinkles up your, it raises your eye, eyelids and it also can give you wrinkles. But you get those little lines in your forehead and it raises up your eyes, your eyelids. Now, around the eye, which is the next, the next very important muscle, is we have actually three sphincter muscles on our body. And two of them, no, four if you count the pair, four sphincter muscles on our body and three of them are on the face. So if anyone calls you a sphincter, you can say, oh, you mean my eye? Because around the eye is a sphincter muscle. And the sphincter muscle mainly is able to contract like this, which protects the eye and makes it watertight. Same with the mouth. There's a sphincter muscle around the mouth as well. And it helps to close the mouth, actually help you actually put your lips out. It's a pretty interesting muscle. Now there's a, a little tendon 
and I don't remember what the tendon is called, but or let's put our eyeball back in here. We'll put eyeball in here. Here's our eyeball inside of our eye socket. and um, muscles on the inside, and then the sphincter muscle on the outside. There's actually little tendons that hold the sphincter muscle down. I think that's because if the sphincter muscle didn't have something to hold the edges down, when it closed, your eye would close into like, well, it would look like, wouldn't look like an eye. It would look like something else. Um, so in this case, and there are people that want to have, when they get facial, uh, a plastic surgery, they can get these tendons cut and moved so that their eyes become more round. In Asians, the, the ligament pulls tighter to help keep the, you know, <laughs> to make your eyes round, to make you look more Western, Western, basically. I suppose there's some people that go the opposite direction and have them pulled tighter so they look more exotic. All right, so that muscle is all across your eyelids, up and down both your eyelids. Here's your eyeballs in there, and you've got your sphinx, you've got your lovely obicularis, obi obicularis oculi. If you think about the Latin words, you can see obicularis means round, oculi means eyeball, ocular, right, works. Okay, now we have a muscle across the nose. It goes like this. And I bet you can guess what that's called. Ever heard of um, somebody having a lot, a, a pronounced, um, oh, what's the word for a big nose? Pro, pro, proboscis? Roman nose, yeah, but proboscis, I think is the word. So this, this uh, muscle on the top of the nose is called a procerus. Honker. <laughs> so we have the muscle on top of the procerus is there. And the procerus draws the skin down at the root of the nose or wrinkles the nose. So when you wrinkle up your nose, this is the muscle that does the pulling. Um, now we're getting into some more, more important muscles. We've got what these cheekbones are all for is for pulling. Is it? pretty pronounced muscle that comes across the face like this and it splits right here. So it has two parts. And this one is called the zygomaticus. Zygomaticus, that makes sense. It's on the zygomatic arch. So it starts to all kind of, you know, take a, you take a Latin class and, and things really start to, to make a lot of sense. This comes all the way down to the base of the nose. We're going to assume that uh, the nose, of course, is made out of strictly cartilage, and, which is interesting because it's like somebody takes a little piece of cartilage and flattens it out and forms it into this shape. And then so that you can see that it goes over. It. And then they do one for the other side, too. And if you've uh, drawn a lot of portraits, you might notice that some people have a dent in the top of their nose, in the end of their nose. And that's just a, a deep place for the um, cartilage. So here's our nose, and here's our nostrils, and here is the zygomatic, zygomaticus, what did I call it? I have a really hard time remembering all the names. Yeah, zygomaticus. It's a good thing I'm not a doctor. I keep hooking things to the wrong things all the time. We've got comes off the zygomatic bone, goes to the corner of the mouth, goes to the bottom of the nose right there. Now, on the side of the nose here, we have actually four different muscles. It's a quadratus lab, labi superioris. So, what does that mean? It means the high muscles. It means there's four of them. Lab, labi or labi means they're alongside the nose. So you have one here, this angular head. And you have one here, that's the infraorbital head, which means it goes from the corner of the nose to the eye. And then you have a 
can't see this, the zygomatic head, which goes underneath this muscle, and there's one more that you can't see, so we're not going to worry about that one. So now we know we have muscles here, we have muscle here, we have this muscle here, we have this muscle here. So you would think that if you blinked your eyes a lot, you would not get bags into your eyes because you would keep that muscle you know, strong and smooth, but that's more a matter of skin elasticity. And then we have the muscles coming down here. All right, so moving on to the mouth. Obicularis. Oris. That's an easy one. Obicularis oris. And it's this huge sphincter muscle that goes around the mouth. And sometimes we wish that it would just seal up and not open up again, but we're not always that lucky. It's a little more complicated in that it has other muscles actually attaching to it. Now this, in the face, you probably you should know by now that muscles in the body always attach from one bone to another, as their main purpose is to pull two bones together or pull two bones back apart. They never can push, they can only pull. But in the face, there are several places where the muscles attach just to the skin, from the bone to the skin, which gives you, you know, why we have so much expression, really, and sometimes muscle to muscle. So these, these parts of the zygomatic um, muscle attached to the corners of the abicularis oris. So you can imagine this uh, sphincter muscle around the mouth to make it nice and airtight and watertight. Now from there we get this is where the this is this is what's really going to help a lot when you draw the face because now you're going to see overlap, underlap, overlap, underlap. Coming out from underneath this zygomatic head, you're going to see the zygomaticus, you're going to see the masseter. The masseter, well, that makes sense. It's masked. Sphincter says what? <laughs> That's true. Uh, the masseter is huge muscle on the side of the face that goes from underneath the zygomatic arch down to the chin, and that's what helps you chew. You know, it's, the, it's a really strong muscle, and it goes right here. And then in front of that muscle comes the triangularis. Ooh, why is it called triangularis? Hey, guess what? It's shaped like a triangle. You can see that. So we have the triangularis, and there's one on either side. And what do you think their, their primary reason for living is? The frown pull down the corners of the mouth yeah so you go in a little bit further <laughs> I love my classmates I love my cl my students they're so awesome um, we go in a little further and we have the quadratus labii inferius inferioris so obviously this is another four-headed or four-part muscle that is lower so we have the superioris up here and the inferioris down here and it's furious, it's so inferior. And that goes under here. And now why in the earth would we need so many muscles in our chin, in the front of our chin? It's all about mouth expressions. So then we have that. And then underneath that even more, there's this one called a mentalis, which attaches, of course, to the mental protuberance. And that's the one that's it actually attaches to the skin. And when you when you pout and when you push up your chin, you get all these little bumply things in your chin. And that's all the little fibers of the muscle pulling down on the connections to the chin. Pretty interesting. Why we needed that, I don't know. But somebody decided we needed that. But notice, because that goes under, this goes over, this one goes under that one, these go under that one. They stick out above it because they stick out of the skin. Uh, what other major muscles should we get in there? We've got the auditory. Remember the auditory opening for the ear is right behind where the jawbone is. So our ear is going to come out here. Pretty much lines up with the eyebrows. And hopefully sticks relatively close to your head so that you have 
an ear attached to the side of your head. There. Now, did I miss anything? There's a caninus, which is, of course, a muscle attached near the top of the canine teeth, and that helps pull things all which way. What I have in my notes is um, the nasalis lowers and compresses the, wi the wings of the nose. I guess these are nostrils that are called wings, which is interesting. Um, and the zygomaticus draws the core corner of the mouth up and outward, outward and upward. The quadratus labii superioris raises the wings of the nose, the upper lip, draws the upper lip outward, deepens the nasolabial furrow. So when you draw a person's face and they get those creases here, that's the nasolabial furrow. Okay. The quadratus labii inferioris draws the up, up, lower lip outward and downward, so that's the pouting muscle. The mentalis raises the skin and wrinkles it, protrudes the lips. Now there's another muscle that's underneath all this called the buccinator, and it actually draws the corners of the mouth out, closes the mouth, compresses lips and cheek. If you go a little bit below that, because you will eventually and get to the neck, a couple of major, the biggest major muscle is going to be the sternocleomastoid, which is the one that comes from the back of the head down to the center of the center of the collarbone, the clavicles, sternocleomastoid. And then on the on top of that, there's a big sheet of fascia. It's called the plyasma. All right, so now how do we turn this into a face and make it look like something not so horrifying? That. Pardon? There's six minutes left, right? All right, that's it, super fast. Using your handy dandy sketchbook, sketch uh, tracing paper, knowing where the structures are, oh no, come back computer. Knowing where the structures are will allow you to see, okay, cheeks overlap because the cheekbones and the zygomatic arch. And we've got this buccinator which gives shape to the jaw, jaw and this goes over it, so there may be a lump here. Um, I put that line in too dark, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Comes on down to the chin, the chin usually squares off. Um, with the eyeball, we know now it's surrounded by muscle and it's sunk inside of a bone, so you can imagine skin coming around the eye, the inner eye there. The outer eye there overlaps a little bit slightly, and then you have your eyeball in there, and you have light light coming from here. So I'm going to leave a highlight there, and I'm going to shadow the dark part of the eye because there's always a shadow cast on the eye from the eyelid because the eyelid has thickness, and the eyelid has thickness on the bottom too. Don't overdo the lines. Try to make it edges. Edges are what's most important. Um, eyebrows are going to be built along the rim of that bone that we talked about, and there's going to be a bit of shadow underneath there for because of the cast of the shadow there. And we have the nose, which has an overhang here, and then the nostrils, which are pieces of cartilage which wrap around. A trick for the nose that's always handy is the nose is sticking out and straight at you. So if you put a little shadow underneath the nose, you give it that little cast shadow and a little reflected light, it's going to give the illusion of the nose coming forward a lot more readily. Um, there's usually a dip right here. Now the mouth, which is another interesting thing, don't ever outline the mouth, especially on men, because it looks very phony. But what you can do is show the change of plane, which means casting a shadow, and a slight change in texture. Now, notice we have these muscles of the mouth that are coming over and around. So the top part of the mouth actually overlaps the bottom part of the mouth in this case. 
and then the bottom part overlaps the upper from the bottom lip, and the top lap overlaps the bottom lip, and then the bottom lap lip overlaps the top lip, and then we get back to the down. So even when somebody is smiling, they're still going to get this place with a muscle. It's got to go under that muscle. And you put a shadow on the bottom side of the lip since it sticks out. And you put a shadow under the lip down there so it sticks out. Um, put a shadow on the side of the nose because it's sticking out. And just start treating things like the objects that they are inside this topography. Uh, when people are angry, they're going to get pulling on these muscles and pulling on these muscles, and you're going to get lines. Sometimes you see people get really strong lines pulling that way. Sometimes you see, you know, the really strong lines pulling this way. But generally, if you um, follow the rules of doing the overlap and the underlap, you can get a pretty good rendition of the face based on minding the structures and the overlaps and understanding there's flesh around the eyes. The eyes are round, they sink in. The uh, cheeks come in in front of the jaw and the these muscles come in in front of the mouth. Um, I don't think I missed anything really important. But um, you can have scowl lines from that corrugator causing problems up there. And remember, you still got the eyes in the middle of the head. So make sure you've got enough head up there, even if you've got hair to cover down over the face. You're still going to need that room for hair. It's got a pretty big chin. I think I would trim that chin down. Basic proportions are eyes in the middle of the head, the nose is in the middle between that, and the lips are a third of the way down to the chin. So that's half. And then this is half again. And then this is a third, a third down from here. This is here. This is half. This is a third, generally speaking. And this, there's the same things across. We have, it, you know, the five eyes across. Five eyes across. Draw straight down from the pupil, you should get to the corner of the mouth. Draw straight down from the inner canthus, you should get down to the corner of the nose. And we saw that all on the skull, so we know that those those uh, make a lot of sense. All right, my time's up. I guess that's it. <laughs>